welcome to another one of our Farm Transition Workbook video series installments. Today we're going to be talking about a number of transactional tools that you can use to transition your farm or ranch to the next generation, and this video is going to correspond with materials in the workbook as you can find in Chapter 3. There are three basic transactional types that we're going to talk about today. First off is the buy-sell agreement, which you're going to see most often in the context of a business entity such as a corporation or LLC being used as a transition tool. We're going to talk about installment sales. And installment sales are the sale of property, but they're a sale in which the price of the sale is going to be recognized over time. And then there are leases. Leases are usually thought of as being a temporary arrangement in which someone's going to get limited use of a piece of property for a limited period of time. And in some ways, leases and installment sales can resemble each other, but there are also some pretty significant differences as well. We're going to talk about both of those as we talk about the installment sales and the leases individually. Now, as we talk about buy-sell agreements, again, you're going to see these in the context of the use of a corporation or an LLC into which ownership of some or perhaps all of the farms or ranches' assets have been placed. And with this, you'll see it as perhaps part of the bylaws, maybe part of the operating agreement, although it may also be a separate contract that's entered into by everyone that owns interests in that entity. And when we talk about a buy-sell agreement, what we're basically saying is that it's a contractual obligation to buy a portion of the membership that's being sold by another member. So really, at the end of the day, what a buy-sell agreement does is govern changes in the entity membership. Whenever someone wants to enter the entity or leave the entity, the buy-sell agreement specifies how we're going to go about making payment for their ownership interest or how that's going to be sold. Buy-sell agreements have a large role to play in the what-if part of transition planning because it's almost impossible for us to know everything that's going to happen with respect to the people that are stakeholders in a farm or ranch entity. And so we need to have some sort of tool available for us so that if someone wants to leave the entity or if someone wants to enter the entity, we have an organized way of figuring out how that can happen. And we also have provisions in place for governing when that should happen. There might be several triggers that might mark the change in membership in a farm entity. Um, obviously, one we think about a lot in transition planning is death. What happens if someone who's a member of the farming organization dies? And how would we go about handling their uh, proportion of the ownership in the farm entity? But the same could also be true for someone who comes under a disability or incapacity. If they simply cannot continue um, as a member of the business entity, is that an opportunity for us to say we're going to divest membership with that person? Divorce is something that also is commonly used as a trigger in buy-sell agreements because we may uh, have people that have bought into the entity as a married couple. And if that married couple is no longer a couple, then we might want to buy out one or both of the members as they exit. Bankruptcy or foreclosure, and this has a number of particular legal nooks and crannies that need to be explored with your attorney, but if someone has used their share of the business to provide collateral for a loan or other form of credit, it may be very important for the business entity to have the ability to buy back that item that was used as collateral, because otherwise the alternative would be that the lending institution could foreclose on that particular piece of the business and now we have a family and we also have a bank as a member of the business and most people feel pretty uncomfortable about that. So b bankruptcy or foreclosure of any one of the members may often be used as a trigger where the entity or some other member is going to buy out that share. Then on another note, there may simply be a need on the part of one of the owners to sell an asset. They might need the cash right now for some expense or something else that they would like to do or they might simply want to leave the business and have determined that being part of the farmer ranch as an active participant isn't for them, and so they'd like to do something else. Now, the first four things that we talked about, these are often what we would call involuntary triggers, meaning that it might actually be important for the long-term survivability of the farm business to say, if any one of these events occur, then automatically the buy-sell agreement is going to be triggered, and we are going, either as an entity or as other owners, to buy out any share that's affected by one of these events. 
On the other hand, the last two items are a little bit more discretionary um, and may trigger slightly different language in the buy-sell agreement. Point being that you may want to consider having different mechanics used in circumstances that are either voluntary or involuntary for the members involved. When we're talking about buy-sell agreements, there's lots of provisions that might need to be included, but some of the really critical ones are to specify a valuation for ownership interests. If we're talking especially about one of those involuntary triggers, we really don't have a way of knowing when those are going to occur. And as a result, it may be important for the entity to respond quickly to buy the ownership shares that are impacted. Well, as a result, we may not have a lot of time to use in figuring out how we're going to value that ownership interest. And valuing the interest in an ownership of a farm or ranch is not necessarily as easy as you might think. As you'll recall from other portions of this video series, the valuation process can be really tough and there are lots of variables to take into play. So we might want to just say, hey, we're going to specify a way that we're going to value this, especially since we might need to do it uh, in a rapid fashion. Now, one way we might just do that is by having an agreed valuation method. We might say that we don't know what that price is going to be, but we all agree that we're going to use this method. Maybe it's an appraisal uh, by a realtor, if we're talking about an asset that's very heavy in land. Um, it may be by an accountant or a business consultant, if we're talking about something that's more of a business entity than really um, a physical asset holding device. The agreed valuation method has advantages not just in terms of speed, but also in terms of fairness. Since we're really talking about this in the context of being a transition tool, and this might be the way of a farm stakeholder receiving their interest in the farm, um, perhaps even as an estate planning item, having an agreed valuation method can really go a long way towards fairness and transparency for all of the people that are involved. A pre-established price is one way that we can go uh, in opposition to the agreed valuation method. Instead of specifying really a procedure for valuation, what we'll do with the pre-established price is just define this is going to be the price per share, uh, per membership unit, or per proportion of ownership held by a, a family member or other form of stakeholder. Now this is obviously very quick. Um, it's very clear to all the parties involved. It's very easy to define, um, but it may not reflect the market. Asset values may uh, increase and decrease over time, as we all well know in agriculture, and so a pre-established price you know, does have some potential drawbacks as well. Um, one recommendation is if we're not going to use the agreed valuation method, which is obviously very flexible but can take a little bit more time, and we favor the pre-established price method, which is very quick but can also be somewhat inflexible, an important element to include with the pre-established price might be to specify how often that number is going to be revised. That's something that we may want to evaluate on at least an annual or at least, uh, if not annual, then every two or three years to reevaluate that number and try to keep it as in line with the market value of the asset as we possibly can. Another important element to consider with most buy-sell agreements is the order of purchase preference, or, or in other words, who's going to have the option and the first option to purchase any membership shares that become available. For example, uh, for many business entities, it may be the entity itself that has the first option to purchase. So let's say, for example, um, someone has decided that they want to leave the farm family business. And if we have an entity preference, we would say, okay, the business entity itself has the first right of refusal to purchase the ownership interest that that person would like to sell. And so the entity would need to have a means of securing the financing uh, to purchase that interest and would have an obligation to do so if it, if it chose. Um, the other alternative that we would have would be for individual members rather than the entity to uh, purchase the interest of someone who's exiting. And if we've got multiple individual members involved, then the next question we have to ask is what's the order of succession for the order in which those people will get to exercise their right of first refusal to buy that exiting membership. Those are important decisions to make and that's definitely something we need to have a lot of conversations about with the family because again, this can be triggered fairly quickly and this can be a really big what if in terms of the farm family's business and especially its ownership uh, composition as it moves ahead. The next transactional tool we can talk about are installment sales. And when we have an installment sale, we have basically a contract for sale of an asset and it can be a, you know, a piece of personal property or it can be real property. But in any case, we're going to transfer possession of that 
asset immediately. So the person that is buying it will receive possession of it. But we're going to pay the price of that asset over time. And generally speaking, that's going to be some period of two years or more. In other words, greater than one year. And so there are some important consequences to that. And it can kind of look like a capital lease. And we'll talk about capital leases when we get to the portion of the video where we discuss leases. But with a capital lease, sometimes maybe called a right to own agreement, we have kind of the same thing. We have a transfer of possession and we've got recognition of a sale price over time, but the lease has a few other wrinkles to it in terms of how we go about receiving that price and the way that the transaction is structured. An important element of the installment sale for lots of folks is the recognition of tax items. How the tax consequences of the installment sale are basically recognized by the seller and the purchaser. And if we're talking about non-depreciating assets, for example land, then taxable income is recognized in the year that it's received. So if we have a 10-year contract and the price of the asset is divided evenly over those 10 years, then each year, one-tenth of that price, in other words, the amount of payment that we receive in that year, is recognized as income in the year it's received. In other words, we don't have to recognize the entire sale price in one year, and that gives some pretty significant advantages, especially if we're talking about some large taxable items. Most commonly, again, when we're talking about non-depreciating assets, it's going to be land. So that's a very important tax advantage for lots of farmers and ranchers. If we're talking about depreciating assets, on the other hand, taxable income is recognized in the year it's received, which that's the same, but what's very different is that all of the depreciation recapture occurs in year one of the contract. So with both non-depreciation, no, sorry, excuse me, non-depreciating and depreciating assets, we're going to have the recognition of the income in the year it's received. The difference is with the depreciation, depreciating assets, the depreciation is going to be recaptured all in year one. Doesn't matter if we have a five or a ten year contract, all that depreciation gets recaptured in year one. And so for depreciating assets, sometimes that depreciation recapture can be a, a strong factor in saying that we don't want to use an installment sale for those depreciating assets. Now we come to leases. And, and leases come in two uh, large categories with many other subcategories, obviously. But we're going to primarily talk today about the operating lease and the capital lease. Now when we talk about an operating lease, that's what you typically think of when you're thinking of basically a rental of property. In other words, we're getting a limited use of property for a limited time and then at the end of that time we're going to turn the asset back to the other party. In other words, there's really no opportunity for the title to the property to transfer here. And in an operating lease, the payments are treated as operating expenses by the lessee, so the person leasing the property can deduct the lease payment as an operating expense. The payment that's made is recognized as operating income by the lessor. The lessor, since they still retain title to the property, can also still claim depreciation on that asset. But the capital lease, this is something that most people kind of think of as a rent-to-own arrangement, or it's a lease arrangement where there's at least the potential that title and possession of the asset could transfer to the other party over time. Now if we have this kind of arrangement and you're the lessee, the payments aren't deductible since you have the opportunity at least to receive title to the property at the end of the agreement or at some point during the agreement. Depreciation is deductible since again you potentially have title to the property and any portion of the payment that's deemed to be interest is deductible. Now that's relatively rare though because in most capital leases you're not going to see that any portion of the lease payment is designated as interest. So you have to be very careful about how the lease is documented before claiming any sort of interest expense on your taxes. For the lessor, they treat the payments under a capital lease as ordinary income and they must recapture the depreciation that they had on the item since they still have a potential um, transfer of title going on there. How do you know if a lease is a capital lease? Well generally if any one of these four factors apply then we're going to regard the lease as a capital lease. First off, is a title 
change at the end of the lease term going to occur? In other words, does the lease specifically say at the end of this lease, title is going to transfer to the lessee? If so, then we have a capital lease. If the lessee has the option to purchase the property at what we would call a pretty significant discount to its market value at the end of the lease, that's another hallmark of a capital lease. If the lease term is a very significant portion of the property's economic life, and the rule of thumb is equal to or greater than 75% of the property's economic life, again, that looks like a capital lease. Or if the present value, if you take the present value of all of the lease payments at the beginning of the lease, add them together, and if that is greater than or equal to 90% of the item's current market value, then all of this pretty much looks like a capital lease. Capital leases are frequently used by equipment dealers, uh, but they're rarely used by farm families as a transition tool. Um, sometimes people want to gradually give someone else, perhaps a younger member of the family, an opportunity to purchase an asset, and so they kind of want to go to a lease purchase option. And that may still be fitting in some circumstances, but in many circumstances, from a tax standpoint at least, the installment sale may be a, a more viable option. But there are other forms of leases that really can be really good transition tools. We've talked about the operating lease. You know, an operating lease can reduce the upfront capital cost of getting farmers because they don't have to actually go out and purchase the asset. They can just lease it over time. And again, they may have both tax advantages and cash flow advantages because they don't have to have a large chunk of capital up front. Leases can also be a great way for beginning farmers to grow their management experience. Um, whether that's a, you know, cash lease or a, mark or a uh, share lease, that can be true, but there's perhaps an additional opportunity to grow that experience through a share lease. And in a share lease, what we're talking about is an arrangement where there's not a cash lease payment. Instead, the lessor and the lessee, or landlord and tenant, in whichever case we're talking about, both contribute to the expenses of the production of the agricultural commodity, and they share in the revenues generated from the sale of that commodity. Now, one advantage is that that provides a means for both parties to have some skin in the game, and people's economic incentives and their intensity of management may be very different if they've got some real upside or downside potential of their own in the outcome of the farming operation, and so that can really kind of enhance the operating and management experience, regardless of who's involved. But since we're sharing in inputs and input and sale decisions, there's a real opportunity there for shared management and decision making. In other words, both parties are going to have some input about what inputs we apply, when we apply them, um, how we go about harvesting or collecting the commodity, how we go about marketing it. And so that's really an opportunity for more seasoned farmers to provide some oversight and some guidance, some mentoring to the younger producer there. For the a uh, founding generation, you know, there can be advantages for them as well. Um, first and foremost, you've got income off of the equity that you've built up in the farm operation recognized through the leasing transaction. So you're getting those lease payments, whether they're in the share arrangement or they're in the cash arrangement. But that can be an important source, perhaps, of retirement income or just the additional cash flow to the operation. And it also gives you an opportunity to potentially evaluate someone who might be a successor to the management of the farm operation. You know, watching them actually do what they're doing on the job can really provide meaningful insights to you about how you think they would go about managing the operation if they had more responsibility. And that can be something that might be uh, important in making decisions for the older generation and can also perhaps uh, provide a level of comfort. If they see someone in a uh, leasing arrangement performing well, they might say, you know what, I feel okay about giving a little bit more responsibility to this person, passing along a little bit more of the uh, responsibility for the operation to them, and I know that they're going to do a good job because I've seen them do a good job in actual real-world circumstances. Now, there are a lot of resources out there to help you develop a good agricultural lease. We can point you to um, Ag Lease 101 or the Ag Land Lease Info website for more information. And you can find information for those websites on the Farm Transition website. But while we're talking about leases, let's talk about 10 really important points that every agricultural lease needs to have. Number one, specify the full legal names for the parties. If land, for example, is owned by some sort of entity, whether it's a trust or an LLC or corporation, make sure that the name of the entity is on there and not the individuals involved. Um, if we're talking about someone who's the lessee, 
Again, make sure that we're talking about a full legal name if we're talking about an individual or if it's being leased by a partnership, corporation, LLC, that that full legal name is used as well. Just as important as we're talking about legal names of the entities, so too is the legal description of the property. Because if you think about it, the legal description is kind of the full legal name of the property that we're talking about. So make sure that you include a complete and correct legal description. Uh, rather than just referring to something as the old Ferguson place or the old Anderson place. Be very specific, and that legal description not only helps someone locate the land, but also forms an important boundary function. It tells someone specifically what land is and is not included. Uh, the Ferguson place doesn't really tell someone much about which land we're talking about in terms of its boundaries, uh, but a complete legal description can give a very accurate boundary and tell you what actually is part of the lease and which part of the land is not included so that we avoid any potential conflicts. Be very specific about when the lease is going to start and end. And it's really important too, if we're talking about cropping systems especially, to make sure that the lease start and end date roughly coincides with the production cycle that we're talking about. We don't want a lease to end um, in the middle of a production cycle when we already have a crop in the ground or it hasn't yet been harvested. So make sure that that lease starts before we've had to make cropping decisions and ends after we've got the crop out of the field so there's a minimum of opportunities for conflict. We may need to be very specific about what the kind of production practices are going to be allowed, which ones are required, and which ones are prohibited. To give you an example, if we're talking about a piece of land that we've been trying to move into a no-till production system and we're going to lease that land out, it's obviously very important to us that we maintain that no-till production system. And so we may specifically require that the person that's leasing land must use no-till production practices. Uh, we may have certain things that we want to prohibit in terms of application of certain chemicals, if other sensitive areas are nearby, um, if we have highly erodible soils, we may want to prohibit uh, very intensive cultivation practices being used, so on and so forth. Who's going to be responsible for the inputs and maintenance of the property. Obviously this is hugely important when we're talking about a share lease, but it's important in any kind of lease to be very clear and explicit who's going to provide what um, in terms of the inputs and also if there are any facilities or other elements of the operational land that need maintenance, who's responsible for taking care of that maintenance. How are rents going to be calculated and how are they going to be paid? Um, even when we're talking about a cash lease, this can be important. Um, how are we going to figure out when the rent is due? How is that supposed to be paid? Uh, many leases that are cash leases are also now adding elements of flexibility. In other words, there may be commodity floor uh, prices and commodity ceiling prices above or below which the lease payment changes based on some calculation. Or there may be production floors and ceilings. If production goes below a certain level or above a certain level, that triggers an adjustment as well. There's nothing necessarily wrong with those adjustment features, but we need to be very clear about when they're triggered and how they're calculated. If we're talking about a share lease, you know there are lots of variables to be taken into account there as well. Um, when is the commodity supposed to be provided to the landlord? Um, where is the commodity supposed to be delivered? You know there are lots of terms that we really need to think through in respect to all of the contingencies that may arise in a share lease, and make sure we've identified all of those. If the landlord has any other interests in the land, such as a mortgage or a mineral lease, um, any agreements for the application of drilling mud, any rights regarding the uh, use of the land for wind energy development, all those need to be disclosed to the lessee so they can understand whether or not there's the potential that some other interest holder might enter the property and engage in some sort of use that could interfere with their agricultural use of the property. It's important to disclose these interests, but it's also important to think through how we're going to adjust the lease if any of these items comes to pass. For example, if we have a crop lease and then there's going to be oil and gas development of the property, how are we going to adjust the rental price if we've got a large well pad in place? Um, is there going to be the sharing of any surface damage payment? Those are all sorts of issues that we need to work through in the context of the lease. We should probably also have a partnership statement that specifies this is a lease agreement, not a partnership. That can be very important from a liability standpoint. We probably need to have notice provisions that say when we're going to provide legal notice to the other party, which mailing address are we going to deliver to, and if there's an emergency notice, how are we going to get in touch with that person most quickly.
Last, we also need to make sure that we have a provision in the lease that talks about how disputes are going to be resolved. And we may want to require that the parties first go to some sort of agricultural mediation or arbitration before we actually allow any litigation to take place. Um, mediation and arbitration are two tools that can really help us resolve these conflicts, hopefully a lot more quickly and hopefully less expensively than litigation and they also really can go a long way towards preserving family unity. Remember, we're talking about leases in this context as a family farm transition tool. This is our family that we're talking about and if there's a way that we can resolve this amicably without having to go to litigation, I think we all come out ahead on that. Like we said, these are just some of the considerations that need to be in a lease. And again, you can refer to the Ag Lease 101 or the Ag Land Lease uh, websites, which are included on the Farm Transition website as links uh, to provide you with more information about how to really flesh out the full details of your leasing arrangement. Well, we've talked about several transactional tools today. Buy-sell agreements can be really important when we're using a business entity as a transition tool and specifically when we've got potential changes in our ownership. When someone's coming to or leaving the business, those buy-sell agreements can really help make that transition as smooth as possible. Installment sales can provide a lot of flexibility as we transfer assets from one generation to the next. They can do so by providing a lot of financing and tax flexibility for all the parties that are involved. Leases can be a very important transactional tool for us also. They can reduce upfront capital costs for beginning farmers and they can provide a revenue source to the, the established generation and also give the established generation a chance to perhaps mentor the next generation as they grow into the business. For more information about this or any of the other topics that we've talked about in the Farm Transition Workshop Series, you can go to agecon.okstate.edu slash farmtransitions and learn more about any of the topics that we've talked about today. Thanks for watching.